Welcome to today's SCA webinar with Bill Ott and Jim Smolin on cement evaluation and remediation. Before I introduce Bill and Jim, I'd like to remind the audience that you are muted. You can ask questions during the presentation using the GoToWebinar question feature, and we will cover the Q&A at the end of the presentation. You will be anonymous. Today's topic is cement evaluation and remediation. Our speakers are Bill Ott and Jim Smolin. Bill is an independent consultant. He's worked on oil and gas assets around the world. He served as an SP Distinguished Lecturer for the 2007-2008 season. He's written numerous technical papers as well as books. Jim has over 30 years of experience in cased hole logging. He started his career with Schlumberger, and he has also worked in the international oil and gas industry as a consultant and trainer, and has also numerous publications to his credit and served as a distinguished lecturer for SPAA. So the class that Bill and Jim teach is entitled Cement Evaluation and Repair Workshop. It's scheduled for March 9th and 10th in Houston, Texas, and it's a two-day course. You can see the content that's covered in the course. We also have live online classes that are upcoming February 6th through 9th. Bob Barbet is teaching best practices for new well fracks and legacy well refracts. Dr. John Lee has two live online classes scheduled. The first one is in late February, production forecasting for low permeability reservoirs. And then in late March, uh, PRMS and SEC reserves and resource regulations. We have upcoming free webinars scheduled in March. Uh, March 7th, Amalia Olivia Riley will be speaking on optimization as a path to lower emissions, myth or reality. And on March 28th, uh, we have Geosteering Best Practices with Jamie Woolsey and Sarah Kulner. And of course, in addition to public courses, SCA's training courses can be brought in-house to your location. There's some contact information if you want to schedule a training course and choose SCA for all of your consulting needs in addition to training. And so I'm going to give the presentation rights now to Jim. And Jim, please take it away. So we see your slides and we see your camera. Looks like you're good. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Jim Smolin, and uh, what I'd like to do is to get you all acquainted with some concepts of how cement bond log works. Um, uh, before we proceed to cement bond logs, maybe we ought to take a look at what we're trying to measure. Typically in the primary cement job, uh, you'll be looking for certain kinds of defects in that cement uh, annular fill. If you look at this figure, you'll notice that uh, figure or channels one and two are uh, effectively uh, in contact with the casing. Channels number three and four are not in contact with the casing, but the cement is. The reason I point this out right now is that when you look at an acoustic cement bond log, what you're going to see is that that tool is responding only to uh, the cement contacting the casing on the outside. So while channels one, two, three, and four may be very similar, channels one and two would be deductible, would be deducted or discriminated by a cement bond log. Channels number 
three and four are virtually invisible to that cement bond log. So remember, the cement bond log is only looking at cement contacting the casing on the outside. This illustrates what a cement bond log tool looks like. This is a conventional one, which has been developed uh, probably over the years since about 1955. Um, what you have is a what you have is a transmitter and two receivers typically. <clears throat> Uh, the transmitter is an acoustic transmitter that emits an omnidirectional signal. That means beep, the signal is going out in all directions equally. Uh, these signals will be detected by the surroundings, and you'll see uh, eventually the signals propagating down from the transmitter to the various receivers. Here we have a receiver typically at three foot spacing from the transmitter. This one here is five foot spacing from the transmitter. These acoustic signals, you see one is going here through the fluid. Another is going through the casing. Another is going through the cement. And another is going through the formation. Now, I've pointed these out so you know that they're there. But understand, the most important one is always going to be the casing signal. Why? Because as that casing signal propagates through the, uh, as the acoustic signal rather propagates through the casing, uh, it will, it's the fastest signal and it will reach the three foot and five foot receivers before the other signals come and, and mess up the data. So uh, what we're going to look at is uh, just the uh, initial signal coming through the casing. This figure here gives you an idea of what uh, some of the crude uh, measurements that we make with the bond log are. On the left-hand side, you'll see that there is a, uh, at the top, free pipe. At the bottom, the pipe is well cemented. How do we tell the difference? Well, we beep, emit that acoustic pulse, which propagates down parallel to the pipe axis, and you would get a wave which looks something like this or something like this. The difference between these two is that, in this case, we have a free pipe. Uh, beep, the signal when it hits a free pipe causes that free pipe to vibrate. Oing, 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 oing. And that vibration is moving parallel to the pipe axis. Uh, down here, on the other hand, uh, you see the cement is very good. If we look at the wave train here, you see the amplitude is much lower. Why is that? Well, in a free pipe, the worst possible cement, the acoustic signal, as I said, goes boing, 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 boing. Uh, if you're in a well-cemented interval, the acoustic signal dies out very quickly. So if the acoustic signal gets into the case steel uh, path and it goes boing, boing, it doesn't maintain itself, it dies out because there's something out there grabbing that casing, and that's the cement. So if you were to look at the amplitude of this pipe here, or here, what you would find is free pipe has a very high amplitude. In this case, it's taken as 100%, but it could be 80 millivolts, 60 millivolts, whatever. Uh, and then here we have the best possible bond. You see that the amplitude is very low. If this is 100%, this is probably in the neighborhood of 3 or 4 or 5%. So this is what we're looking at. The primary thing is the amplitude of the signal coming through the pipe. And remember, a high amplitude for a signal coming through, through the pipe is in, in an indication of free pipe or bad bond. A uh, very low amplitude is an indication of good. Uh, this uh, illustrates uh, some problems that have historically uh, been with the uh, cement bond log. And probably one of the most uh, serious problems historically has been the centralization of the tool. Typically, this is not a problem today because people are much more conscious of it. But to give you an idea of how sensitive the tool, the measurement is to centralization, 
let's take a look at this little chart right here, this little curve here. The numbers on the bottom are referred to the number of inches the tool is excentralized relative to the center of the casing. Um, if the tool is directly in the center, you're going to get 100% of the acoustic signal. In other words, the signal is coming down and it converges onto the tool from all sides equally. What happens if the tool is not centralized? Well, if the tool is excentralized by one fourth of an inch, you see that according to this chart, we have lost 50% of our signal. Clearly, if if the signal of, if we lose 50% of the signal, we don't know what we're measuring. Um, to give you another little point to think about here, one eighth of an inch excentralization. Uh, is going to lose about a third of the signal. So the bond logs typically have to be centralized within at least one eighth of an inch to the center uh, of the casing. And that's true whether this casing is vertical or deviated. One uh, concept that uh, I'd like to point out right now is a thing called bond index. Uh, bond index is defined here as the attenuation. Uh, at some point, I divided by the attenuation uh, in, in, uh, uh, of the good cement. Now, uh, when you look at this, we're looking at a new term here. We looked at amplitude before. Remember, with amplitude, high amplitude, bad bond, low amplitude, good bond. Now we're looking at attenuation rate, which means how fast does that signal die away? So if you have a high attenuation rate, it's fully cemented in place and cement is grabbing that casing from all sides. If on the other hand, uh, we have a poorer bond, the casing may be shaking uh, in a vertical manner if we have uh, a channel out. So uh, what we can do is with this bond index is then define it to be attenuation at some depth I divided by the attenuation of that particular cement uh, uh, around the tool. Now here I'd like to add one, one other thing. Bond index is sometimes used to give us an indication of whether or not the channel, there is a channel even beyond the cement. If we look at this chart here, this is a chart that Slumberjay came up with. What it says is that, hey, bond index of 0.8. That could be good or it could be bad. But one of the things that we can define is how to check for it. Here we have at the casing size at this axis, minimum cement interval at this axis. Five and a half inch casing requires a minimum interval of five feet. What does that mean? Well, it means if you have, you need five continuous feet of 0.8 bond index, that is 80% annular fill or better, to have a reasonable assurance of isolation. Um, if we have a 0.8 bond index with seven inch casing, we need 10 continuous feet, again, to have a reasonable assurance of isolation. Notice this does not guarantee isolation, but well, what it's saying is that eh, some bond, if you over a long enough interval, will give you a reasonable shot at uh, isolation. So this is an assure, reasonable assurance, but it's no guarantee. This illustrates a, a little section of a cement bond log. This dashed curve here, the thin dashed curve is uh, uh, part of the uh, amplitude is zero to 10 millivolts. Uh, anyway, what this does is we're looking for, here is the cutoff for a, a bond index of 0.6. Here is the cutoff for a bond index of 0.8. The, the, the problem here is that if we have 0.8 bond index, we're looking for 10 continuous feet. Yes, we have it here. Yes, we have it here. And yes, we have it here. So we find three intervals, 10 continuous feet or better that have a reasonable assurance of isolation over this locked interval. 
if we use bond index of 0.6, now we start playing tricks on ourselves because we're playing with numbers. Uh, we need 10 foot intervals of 0.6 bond index. Well, now we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Clearly the red uh, flags here indicate a well cemented interval, much better cement than a 0.8 bond index. But just exactly the opposite is true. Uh, the red indication uh, is essentially uh, looking at uh, a bond index um, uh, as a lesser degree of annular fill, and we're still getting uh, you're getting better cement. That's just not really happening. So this is how it, how, how it would look. This is uh, if we assume 0.6 bond index, the bond looks good. If we assume 0.8, it doesn't look good at all. Okay, this is a, a different, slightly different type of cement bond tool. It has a transmitter, a three foot and a five foot receiver, just as we had before. Well, what we have at two feet, and there are variations in the way this is designed, this particular tool has six transducers. One, two, three, four, five, six transducers. Well, this one has eight over here, but the, the tool can have six or eight transducers. Now, as you're logging, these uh, transducers will emit an acoustic pulse and effectively will measure the attenuation of some sector of the bond log. If we have uh, six uh, fingers here, then we're effectively looking at uh, 60 degree sectors of the bond log, and we're measuring the vibrations parallel to the pipe axis, uh, except we're doing it rather totally like we did a moment ago. We're doing it individually, 60 degree sector, 60 degree sector, 60 degrees a sector and so on. Then what we do, we take this casing numbers that we get and we open it up and unwrap that casing. Uh, here we have a, 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 a bond log of this type. You see here we have a high amplitude. What does that mean? Good bond or bad bond? It means bad, bad bond, very bad bond. Here we have very low amplitude. That's a good bond. Very good bond. Um, if we looked at the individual sectors in that bond log, remember there were six of them. One, two, three, four, five, six. The shading here indicates uh, uh, the bond quality. The black is good quality bond. The white is uh, free pipe or no bond. And you see down here, the six sectors up here are one, two, three, four, five, six. They're all white. This is uh, essentially free pipe. No extremely poor bond, worst possible bond. Come down here, we see we have six sectors that are all black. Very good pipe because every sector is co co covered with cement. This one here is going to be very poor cement, all six sectors. Uh, none, none of the six sectors are showing a good bond. And you can see here there's a finger, if you will, of cement because. This particular uh, presentation is taking that casing and it's unwrapping it and showing us a map of cement or no cement. Okay, this is another tool. This is a segmented bond log from uh, Baker Hughes. Not sure what Baker Hughes' name is right now, but uh, basically, this is a, a very good type bond log. It's a pad type, it has one two, three, four, five, six pads. If you look at the right here, you see pad number one, pad number two, pad number three, and so on. Well, as you're logging, these pads will fire in sequence. This pad followed by this pad, followed by this pad, followed by this pad. So the tool will be logging beep, 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 it's emitting an acoustic pulse. This pulse is uh, from, from transducer number one. The pulse propagates along the casing wall and then is detected between pads two and three and beep between pad six and five. 
So we measure the attenuation in each of these one, two, three, four, five, six sectors. And here you have a color chart that shows that. Here is peep transmitter one emits the acoustic pulses detected between pads two and three, pad six and five. We go the other direction, peep between five and six, between three and two. We get an individual uh, attenuation uh, or bond quality measurement in each of these sectors. And this is what we'll get. Here is the conventional bond log with that uh, tool. And here is the uh, SPT with the various uh, six tracks or six uh, sectors between the pads. Down here we have one, two, three, four, five, six sectors. Uh, these are uh, pretty much blackened, indicating that you have a very good bond over these sectors. And the bond is <laughs> pretty uniformly spaced all around the, uh, the casing. Up here, we have again one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, uh, six sectors again. And we're seeing this is all white, so that indicates the bond quality across this interval is pretty bad. So we have good bond quality, bad bond quality, and this is the same kind of presentation that we had seen just a moment ago uh, over, over here. Okay, what I want to do is take a quick look now at these pulse echo tools. They're slightly different. Um, what the pulse echo tool has is um, a, a rotating head. That rotating head has a transducer in it, and that transducer is going beep, 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 as that head rotates. I think there are about 30 beeps per resolution. And what we're measuring then is we're measuring a signal perpendicular to the casing. Uh, we, we have some basic measurements. Let me show you what they are. If we look at this vicinity here with, of the tool, we have a transducer. That transducer emits an acoustic pulse, beep, echo. Here we have fluid, here we have casing, here we have cement. So the first echo amplitude, we, we beep, emitted a casing signal or emit a, a pulse, an acoustic pulse, it hits the casing wall and it reflects back. So basically what we're looking at now here is the casing, beep, echo. If that casing is smooth, beep, the echo comes back strong and I'm indicating uh, that the inner surface is good quality. If the uh, beep comes back, beep, Echo, uh, if that echo is uh, spread apart and uh, differential, which uh, spreads apart a little bit, then you see that that's an indication of the surface roughness over there. So we have one signal as an indication of, I'm sorry, I got these mixed, mixed up. The one from here to here and back, we know what the acoustic fluid is. So we can measure the acoustic velocity and we know the time of travel here to here. So that gives us. First, what is a measure of the uh, first echo amplitude or surface roughness? Second one is a measure of the uh, internal casing. Uh, beep, however, wherever the casing is, if there's corrosion, we get a reflection back, and that's a measurement of the internal radius. Then we have a measure of this wave, uh, wave train frequency wall thickness. Imagine, beep, that that acoustic signal gets to this wall. When it hits that wall, some part of that acoustic signal goes through, some is reflected back. Then when the signal that's reflected back hits over here, it's reflected back again. In any case, we induce a, basically a rattling around of an acoustic signal in that casing. Beep, 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 beep. And if we measure the time between beep beeps, beep beeps, that will give us an indication of the velocity through the steel casing uh, and the distance from one, one side to the other. So again, this is a measure of uh, the wall thickness. 
And then lastly, we measured the rate at which this series dies out. Beep, 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 beep. If that signal dies out very quickly, and that indicates you have cement out here, there's something out there that's absorbing that signal and preventing the pipe from rattling around. If on the other hand, you had free pipe over here, beep, boing, that pipe would tend to rattle uh, in, in, in a front mode. Uh, so it's a very similar thing in concept to the other bond log, except we're activating the pipe in a drum mode that is perpendicular to the wall of the pipe. Okay, this is a, it gives us a brief illustration of how uh, <clears throat> how the data is presented. This uh, particular map here is a map that shows the uh, internal roughness. You see a little rough part over there, a little rough part over here. And these uh, roughness indications are basically cable scoring. Uh, as you log many times, many over many logs, uh, you wear a, ga a gouge indicates it. Here we're looking at the uh, internal radius um, of the uh, inner surface. Here we're looking at the wall thickness, a map again of that inner surface. And here we're measuring the acoustic impedance or the strength of the cement on the outside. Uh, what they've done here is this is uh, uh, from zero to about a value of six. Here what they've done is they've cut up every, cut up uh, uh, a threshold so that if the uh, acoustic signal causes vibrations, it indicates that this is a channel or at least has no contact with the cement. If we have contact with the cement, we have a, a good cement job over there. And if you look at this, you'll see that there's a, like a ring of cement all the way around the casing right here, all the way around the casing right here, all the way around the casing up here. And here is a channel, a clear channel. There are some other um, modifications as to how we uh, could use this particular tool. Uh, what we can do is record the individual uh, strength of the signal being reflected. If the reflected signal is straight like this as we log, uh, that's due to the fact that what you have outside is homogeneous. That means you have a liquid outside of casing, liquid outside of casing, liquid outside of casing. Where the uh, attenuation is going uh, strongly rattling around, that indicates you have cement on the outside. Uh, just to give you a quick look at one of these, here we have a Halliburton log. That cement is uh, the casing is unwrapped, and you could come around. Even even a blind man can look at it, can uh, interpret the log. If this was raised ink, he could come over here and say, "Cement, cement, 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 cement." Oh no! Whoops. Uh, uh oh, up here, what do we get? Uh, oh. Yeah, uh, here we have uh, uh, no cement. So you can get a quick look of it. And uh, also what, what will be available is you can get uh, maps, uh, video maps that show what's happening to the casing and the cement as you're logging to the interval. Thank you. Uh, if you find these problems, Bill is gonna uh, take over here and give you a, a insight as to how to remedy these things. Thank you and I'll uh, introduce Bill uh, now. So, Bill, we see your slides. All right. So, appreciate the lead in. I think you can you see can and hear. Go ahead and everything. turn on your camera. Everything so you can't see me. Huh? Okay. I can fix that. Now we're good. We got it. Right. Great. Take we're it rolling. Away. Okay, Jim. Appreciate you passing the passing the torch. Those voids that uh, Jim identified with the uh, bond log samples he showed you are potential of need of repair. The objective of primary cementing is to provide zone isolation. And uh, most often we want to uh, do uh, a cement squeeze. 
which is a dehydration of cement that we put inside of this void. And that's what we have to have, is we have to have a void and the opposite of what we're squeezing has to have permeability. So we squeeze the liquid or the water from the cement slurry in order to leave the solids in the void. So that's the repair. But what we're going to discuss here are alternatives to cement when squeeze cementing. So the situation is, okay. There are situations where we have a, a need for an alternative. And that's because the cement particles are too large. Okay, that is particularly true where we have a microannulus. So a microannulus can be much smaller than the diameter of the cement particle. So the average particle size of uh, say class G or class H cement is about 25 microns or about a thousandth of an inch. And these are too large in order to fit into the microannulus space. So what I need to look at is an alternative for the, uh, the cement. And that's what we're going to con consider now. But before we get into that, we want to look at uh, maybe quantifying, you know, the leak flow through a microannular space. And here's a uh, relationship which can uh, give you an idea of the thickness. After knowing the thickness, then you can determine the leak rate. So the leak rate is in barrel per day. And if we know the pipe outside diameter, and we can uh, determine the width of the microannulus, and if we're going to have a water leak, the viscosity is going to be one centipoid. And there's going to be a pressure differential across the interval, which is in PSI, and then whatever the length of the interval might be, 10 feet, 100 feet, whatever. So here is the, putting some numbers to it. OK, so first looking at the illustration, so we've, we've got the uh, pressure differential of 100 PSI from uh, point A to point B. And the 0.0024 inch pipe expansion with 10,000 or 1,000 PSI internal pressure. So what we have is a, uh, a 0.0012 or 12 thousandths of an inch micro annulus and what would be the worst case for casing flow is we're going to have the leak between a and b so if we take all these numbers and put it back into the equation on the previous slide it's going to provide us a, a leak potential of a 3.13 barrels per day of water okay there can be uh you know not that can be an irregular shape of the microannulus. In many instances, you can pressure the pipe up and have it expand to seal it. But then during production, you're going to have the, uh, the 100 PSI pressure differential would, would allow for the leak paths. So how do we fix this? Well, we're going to look at potential of uh, three alternatives. The first one here is a pressure activated sealant. And this, this uh, type of leaking with a microannulus is particularly troublesome and is identified by a term called sustained casing pressure or SCP. So in other words, you may have a, a well and there's a pressure on the annulus that stays and doesn't go away. And that's because of a leak through a microannulus in many situations. If we go up north of the US to Canada, they have a different term for it. It's called sustained surface casing vent flow, SCVF. And uh, so the situation is you can use this uh, pressure activated sealant, 
from uh, Seal Tight and ACC Core Corporation, and it's uh, described in this SBE paper. So what you have is uh, a leak. So you put a sealant in the leak, and then where you see the pressure differential occur, polymerization takes place and plugs off the leak. And this material can also be used to seal pinholes in uh, capillary tubing, and there can be other applications, but the cement application here is for repairing microannuli. So here's a look at uh, how it is when it's in the liquid form. And this can be used, it's the illustration on the, uh, on the left. So it's a total liquid, very small quantities are ne necessary to do it. And this product can be used in the harshest environments. It's gonna maintain sealing integrity or a pressure seal upwards to 500 degrees Fahrenheit with a differential pressure of uh, 22,000 PSI. So here's what it looks like after polymerization when it gets exposed to a pressure drop, the leak, there's gonna be a pressure drop through the leak or through the hole in the capillary tubing or whatever the situation. Okay, so here it is, a pressure activated sealant. It's gonna remain fluid like we saw in that illustration until it's released through the leak site. And only at that point of differential pressure through the leak site will you get the sealing. So it's uh, the remainder will stay liquid. And again, you need small quantities, not like squeeze cementing with cement where you need barrels of fluid. Here, only uh, small quantities in the uh, cat gallon cat category. Hmm. So another alternative to cement is a, a called, called control seal resin. It's an epoxy based resin from wild well control. And this is uh, pretty effective and has been used in uh, plug and abandonment inter intervention. So the primary plug material with reduced or eliminated solids can readily penetrate formation and prevent dehydration for a more robust plug. So that's the whole functionality of it. And this product can be bullheaded through pipe or called tubing into the production tubing where the leak has occurred. And this could be uh, probably more frequently a, uh, a minor leak through the casing itself, which is uh, more applicable, not so much the uh, microangulus as I mentioned just a little bit ago. Okay, so uh, where cement fails to penetrate, so the uh, pore volume of a 2040 wet mesh sand is uh, going to be very, very small. And when we're looking at the penetration of uh, cement, it's not going to make it because it's uh, in this illustration here, the 2040 mesh flowed right through this uh, Conduct, conductor here, but we can use a control seal to penetrate through the 2040 mesh sand and create a tight seal bond. So that's a, it's a solid bond in comparison to having uh, the loose material. So the resin in effect glues all of these uh, solids together. In this case, in this case the, the illustration was uh, 2040 mesh sand. One of my favorite alternatives to cement is uh, sodium silicate. So it's a, a, a solids free, but it's liquid or a colloidal solution, which typically has some colloidal particles ranging from one to five nanometers. It's a liquid and it's, uh, it's a liquid material that's manufactured by Fusing or uh, uh, fusing sand and uh, sodium carbonate at a high temperature, 1100 to 1200 degrees, and what you get is a glass, and this can be dissolved with high pressure steam, in order to perform a perform a product which is known as 
water glass or liquid sodium silicate. So it's a very unique chemical, which we're going to describe the uniqueness of this shortly, but it's Na2SiO3. Here's a little bit of the uh, chemical structure of it. You have oxygen bonding with the two sites on the silica. And at the molecular level, it's a complicated mixture of different sizes and shapes without getting into that. But most importantly, this is negatively charged. So you have these uh, positive uh, anions and they'll be in this associated with this negatively charged silicate. Mm. Okay, so sodium silicate can undergo four very distinct chemical reactions. So it's uh, gelation. The liquid becomes a silica gel. And if you've uh, ever had a prescription filled and uh, there's this little packet of material in the pill bottle, that is silica gel. Or maybe you bought an electronic device of some sort, a little packet of silica gel. So that's the uh, sodium silicate originating, and then you gelet, you have it gel. In this case, uh, for those cases, it's going to be with a uh, sulfuric acid system. The second mechanism of uh, reaction is precipitation. So if the sodium silicate contacts di divalent sodium or divalent uh, liquid ions in a uh, liquid or <laughs> in the water, calcium or magnesium, it'll react to perform a either a calcium silicate or not shown here as a magnesium silicate. Calcium silicate is the most predominant. The fourth one here is a hydration, dehydration. So the sodium silicate dehydrates. The chemical terminology of that is a sideresis. So uh, the molecule actually shrinks and loses water and that dehydrates that into a glassy state. And there's a, the fourth one here is a surface charge modification. So the sodium silicate will donate its negative charge. Okay, so we can do some channel blocking, you know, fix the microannulus, uh, which is pretty much the, uh, a really good utility for it can also be used as a pre-flush ahead of primary cementing to inhibit the potential of lost circulation. And what I'm going to show here are these mechanisms that we just described with some pictorial illustrations. So the first one here is we have uh, polymerization. Okay, so we form a uh, calcium silicate. I can go backwards here. Oh, I'm going the wrong direction. Okay. So what we have next is polymerization, which is uh, figure B. So we get the uh, sodium silicate polymerized into the silica gel. Then we have direct bonding, which is C, sodium silicate bonds directly with cement. Okay, well, there's also some calcium silicate in the cement comp composition and the sodium silicate bonds to it. It kind of links it together and makes a cementaceous seal. The dehydration, it loses water to perform the glassy film. Okay, that's uh, that's D. So it, it looks uh, actually it can collect solids as is shown here and 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 encapsulate or trap the solids so they not become mobile and they will actually add to the competency of the set system. And then we've got uncoated cement. So the cement reacts with it, sodium silicate. It's a dilute system of one part silicate to three parts water. And so the silicate embreds uh, the bridging agent into a continuous matrix. 
So in other words, if there's solids left from the uh, mud filtrate, and uh, this happens to be in a void space that you're trying to squeeze, you can uh, make a continuous matrix because the, the silicate will bond with the particles that are there and to create a solid similar there to what we had shown earlier. Okay, so here's a illustration of uh, gas migration. Now this is not an illustration of uh, micro annulus. What we show here is this is gas migration paths after cement placement. While cement is in the uh, gelation phase, that loses its hydrostatic pressure and uh, gas can migrate and create these channels through the onset cement while it's still in the gel form. So the goal for these treatments is to remedy the sustained casing pressure or the uh, surface casing vent flow is to place sodium silicate in the leak and then have it precipitate, polymerize, or dehydrate to form a plug. So these uh, pathways through the gelled cement are very, very small and uh, no solid particles. Even the micro cement particles would be uh, too large to be effective in uh, re remediating these uh, gas migration paths or gas flow after primary cement. So this is a uh, approach of uh, repairing the uh, cement casing pressure or surface casing pressure and uh, surface casing vent, vent flow. It's a little bit like a, uh, a squeeze operation. I like using the seal type that requires small volumes. So here we are only looking at two liters per stage. So that's you, you pump it in, wait, release the pressure, and so on and so forth. And you do this continuously until you get what's referred to as a standing squeeze pressure. So what happens is during the condition of uh, filling up these holes, this uh, liquid will be able to permeate, penetrate further in order to uh, more effectively seal them. And then you're able to uh, get a total isolation and control this gas flow after primary cementing. So that concludes the remarks I have. In summation, cement particles can be too large in order to fix a lot of the uh, leak problems. And again, we want zone isolation, and that's part of the objective of uh, remediation of uh, not competent cement jobs. So let me pass it back to our moderator. Great. Thank you very much, Bill. So we have a question that has uh, come in from our audience. And this question is for you, Jim. Um, you talked about the importance of centralization. Uh, talk about how you manage that in horizontal wells. Well, you have to put a stout centralizer on it. I mean, there's not much else you can do because if you put a wimpy centralizer on it, it'll just fall right to the low side of the casing. And clearly, you need to have it symmetrical uh, along the axis of the casing. <clears throat> so, um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to create a monster uh, in terms of a well then because there's going to be a channel that may be hard to access or something like that. Thank you. Uh, next question is for you, Bill. Talk about the costs of these uh, various alternatives to cement that you've mentioned. All right. Well, you know, it depends on the volume. Of course, uh, the resins are very much more expensive, particularly the, uh, the seal tight, but you really require very small quantities of it. And uh, so in cement is... Uh, going to be the least expensive unless you're going to want to uh, solve your uh, leak problem with uh, sodium silicate. So sodium silicate is probably uh, the most reasonable economic, but you may uh, need a little bit larger 
quantities like solving the flow of uh, gas migration after cementing, or when, if you notice, there wouldn't be very much volume of the liquid to place in a uh, micro and an annulus. So uh, in summation, you know, the resins, the seal type, the, seal, the control seal are going to be a lot more expensive. Volumes will be less. But the uh, sodium silicate is uh, would be to me the most uh, has the most utility and probably the um, most effective for for the cost. Thank you. The next question. Uh, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Do you find that with more and more CCUS projects that the level of remedi remediation activity is increasing? as more and more projects evaluate the risk of leakage? Yes, there's a uh, cement integrity is what's required. And a lot of these wells are not new, are not young anymore. They're more and more mature. And so if in order to uh, remediate, you know, older wells that have the developed leaks or maybe in developed cracks in the cement, uh, due to uh, cyclic pressure and production and release of, of pressure, there is certainly a more more need for these alternatives to to cement. And uh, so, you got to have cement integrity in order to get an effective, uh, accept, uh, acceptable plug and abandonment. You know, according to uh, state or federal regulations, depending on. Where, where you are. So the answer is yes, there's going to be more need to reestablish or initially establish well integrity. Very good. Well, that's all the questions we have from our audience today. So I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Later today, you'll receive a link to a recording of the webinar, an evaluation form, and a link to SCA's website with more information about how to register for Cement Evaluation and Repair Workshop. That's the training course that Bill and Jim will lead at SCA's office, uh, the Houston Training Center on March 9th and 10th. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye.